with respect to the coming of Christ. And the critics have argued that Jesus' predicted coming did not occur within the time frame that the New Testament gives for the fulfillment of that event. And as we've seen so far in our study, the critical phrase in the Olivet Discourse is the reference to this generation, where it is said, this generation will not pass away, I'll use the phrase pass away, until all these things are fulfilled. Now, an ordinary prima facie understanding of this text, as Bertrand Russell made it in his critique of Christianity, as well as the higher critics in biblical scholarship, say that this generation must refer, literally, to that group of people who were the contemporaries of Jesus, and a generation lasts approximately 40 years, and that the pass away refers to their demise. That is, that this group of people uh, will not all die or pass away until everything in this prophecy comes to pass. The all these things is then thought to be all-inclusive. Now, we also see that the whole problem is exacerbated by our knowledge, as I've mentioned, that that which precipitated the whole discourse, Jesus' prediction of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, did in fact take place within the time frame of 40 years as these events unfolded in A.D. 70. So I think, again, we see and feel the weight of the problem. I, I labor this point for this reason. I'm not convinced that evangelical Christians really do feel the weight of this problem. And that's part of the problem of ignoring higher criticism and simply preaching to the choir and, and talking to among ourselves and not really listening to this criticism that is raised. And we have to give an answer to these critics uh, that have devastated uh, uh, Scripture and the person of Christ. And so I think it is our obligation as Christians who believe in uh, the deity of Christ and in the uh, inspiration of the Scriptures to feel the weight of this burden and to address it as we encounter it. Now, there are many scholars who feel that the escape hatch from all of this difficulty is found in verse 32 of Mark 13. Immediately following the time frame reference that Jesus gives, again in verse 30, he says, Assuredly, most certainly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Again, let me remind you that the statement that Jesus makes here is made in emphatic terms. I can't conceive of Jesus being any more emphatic about the time frame than he is here when he says, assuredly, I say to you that this generation will by no means pass away until all of these things take place. Then he goes on to amplify that by saying, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So Jesus is hanging an awful lot of his own credibility on what he's saying here. These are my words, and my words will last longer than the heaven and the earth. So then we hear the escape hatch in verse 32. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now that verse, 32, is one of the most controversial verses in all of Mark's gospel because, it, among other things, it's a verse in which Jesus puts a limit on his own knowledge when he said that the day and the hour knows nobody, not even the angels, not even the Son, just the Father. And that's provoked all kinds of Christological debate 
But obviously, Jesus is referring here to his human nature, and the human nature is not omniscient. It would be heretical to assert that the human nature of Christ knew everything. The divine nature did, of course, but the human nature knows only what a nor normal, ordinary human being could know, or a human who is informed by the divine. I mean, there are times when there is knowledge communicated from the divine nature to the human nature. We're not separating them, but we are distinguishing them. But I don't want to get carried away on that. That's a Christological issue. <clears throat> but with respect to this problem that we're dealing with, many scholars come to verse 32 and they say, obviously Jesus here is qualifying his prediction by saying, after all, Nobody really knows the day and the hour, including me. So, in a sense, Jesus has a get-out-of-jail-free card here for being wrong about stating that it would all take place within the time frame of this generation. And so, since he has this disclaimer, that nullifies or uh, reduces the import of his previous statement that it would come in this generation. Well, I think this is another one of those examples of where a text is problematic. Sometimes scholars use tortuous devices to try to solve the problem. There's no reason to see that verse 32 would nullify Jesus' broader statement earlier when he says simply, this generation will not pass away until all of these things take place. And then he qualifies it by saying what? I don't know what day in this generation. I don't know what hour it will be, but I do know this. It's going to be within the time frame of this generation. That sometime within this generation, before this generation passes away, all these things will come to pass, but don't ask me for the day and the hour. That would seem to be a much more sober understanding of what Jesus is saying here, and we don't want our Lord to put them on and take them off, as it were, to assert that it's going to happen within a time frame with his left hand, and five minutes later, less than five minutes later, say, well, it's not going to happen in that time frame. Once he's made the statement as emphatically as he had, that it will take place most definitely, most assuredly, within the time frame of a generation. And we have to live with that. And we have to say, okay, what does he mean by generation? And what does he mean that this generation will not pass away? Again, the critics, including Bertrand Russell, understand the phrase, this generation, to refer to a group of people who were the contemporaries of Jesus, those people who were alive at that time, uh, uh, referring to an age group of human beings. So, when uh, Jesus qualifies it, as it were, in verse 32, uh, he is saying, I can't be any more specific than it'll be this generation but keep this in mind, that does not mean that he's any less specific that it would be within the time frame of that generation. Now, again, this business of passing away, we're assuming that it refers to the death of those who are alive. Now, that is consistent with the other time frame reference that Bertrand Russell used to refute the New Testament and to refute Jesus, when Jesus said, some of you will not taste death until you see uh, the Son of Man coming in power and so on. Now there, the passing away becomes taste death. So there's a consistency here that we're talking about that some people are going to survive long enough to see certain events that Jesus predicted fulfilled. What else can he mean when he says some of you will not taste death? Now, again, in an effort to deal with that problem you know, that's uh, found in Matthew 16, we are told by 
certain scholars, that that f was fulfilled in either the transfiguration or the resurrection. Because in the transfiguration, people did see Jesus manifested in glory. Because on the Mount of Transfiguration, his divine nature shone through, and the disciples, the Peter, James, and John, had that awe-inspiring encounter there with the transfigured Jesus where they beheld his glory. And so maybe what Jesus was referring to was either to the manifestation of his glory in the transfiguration or the manifestation of his glory in resurrection or ascension, not to his coming later. Now, there's a problem with that, and that is that the transfiguration, according to Matthew, took place six days after Jesus gave that time frame reference. And the resurrection, only a couple of weeks, and so on. So it doesn't seem very reasonable to me for Jesus to say, some of you aren't going to die until this takes place, unless he was expecting uh, the majority of his disciples to die in the following week. And when he was simply saying, some of you are going to survive long enough to see this come to pass. It just doesn't seem likely to me that our Lord would, would say, would speak in terms of surviving death in an event that's going to take place in the next week or the next couple of weeks, unless, of course, they were faced with an impending uh, battle where survival was not expected or something of that sort, which we obviously don't have at this point. So my point is this, that to apply that text of some of you will not taste death to the, uh, uh, to the transfiguration or to these other events related to it in the short term, I think is too near a time. I think Jesus, when he says that some of you will not taste death, is obviously thinking longer term than one week or a month or so. Well, now another way, in fact, the most common way in which scholars try to answer the critics with respect to the unfulfilled prophecy of the New Testament and of Jesus is by interpreting the word generation in a way that does not make it refer to that group of people who were alive at the time Jesus made the prophecy and who were the contemporaries of Christ. But rather, the term generation is used to describe a kind, type, or sort. A kind, a type, or a sort of person. That's like Jesus was saying, people like this will not pass away until all of these things come to pass. Now again, that's the most common. Now, some scholars say that the type of person that Jesus is describing here is the believer or the righteous ones. That some of you who are faithful and believing and trusting in me will not pass away until all of these things will be fulfilled. In other words, there will be believers still around whenever I return at the end of the age. That's one of the interpretations. And of course, that interpretation gets everybody off the hook because then generation doesn't refer to a 40-year period and restrict the fulfillment to uh, the first century and allows for the possibility of what Schweitzer called parousia, delay, down through the centuries that we can wait 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years for these things to take place. Now, more commonly, the generation that is described as a type or a sort of people refers not to the righteous or to believers, but to unbelievers, those who were of a wicked sort, a wicked generation. And 
Herman Ritterboss, whom I've already talked about, who gave us the already and not yet time frame approach to the kingdom of God teachings in the New Testament, Ritterboss takes the view that the Greek word here, ganea, that is used to interpret or to be translated generation, is a description not of time frame, but of mind frame. That is, it's a mind frame reference saying people of this frame of mind will still be around until all of these things come to pass. Again, this ilk, this sort, this type of person will abide until all of these things are fulfilled. Now, again, that is the most common view that conservatives and evangelicals take to the Olivet Discourse to escape the guns of higher criticism. And I personally, frankly, find this less than exegetically satisfying. Uh, I do know that there are rare occasions in the Septuagint and in extra-biblical documents where that, ver or that word, ganea, can be used to refer to sort or kind or type of person. But the usage of it in the New Testament overwhelmingly and consistently refers to a group of people who are alive at the particular time. And I want to take some time now to look at some of these passages. And the first passage we look at is in Matthew 23, verse 36. Now, the, in this context, Jesus is giving his final address that he gives presumably on the very same day that he gives the Olivet Discourse. And he said, quote, All of these things shall come upon this generation. Now, to my understanding, I'm not aware of any commentator or any Matthean scholar who's ever interpreted that reference to anything other than those contemporaries that were alive at the time when Jesus talks about the things that will befall that generation. In Matthew 11, he says, whereunto shall I liken this generation? Again, the commentators all agree that that referred to the existing generation of Jewish people. In, in uh, Matthew 12, 39, 41, 42, and 45, listen to what we read. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation. Obviously, the men of Nineveh was an earlier, were an earlier generation. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. And this can only refer to the then current existing generation of people that Jesus was warning. Again, Luke 11, verses 50 and 51. That the blood of all the prophets may be required of this generation. Again, it shall be required of this generation. Mark 8, 38, Whoever shall be ashamed of me in this adulterous and sinful generation. And Luke 17, 25, The Son of Man must be rejected of this generation. Now, if we understand the biblical context in which our Lord makes these statements, He's clearly talking about the decisive point in redemptive history where God has visited the nation of Israel in the person of His only begotten Son. And it was that generation that was alive at that time that had on the one hand the unspeakable privilege of seeing the Messiah come in the flesh. And yet at the same time, it was that generation who were convicted of the greatest guilt in Jewish history 
because that was that generation that rejected the one who had come to their own, and they received him not. And so Jesus again and again in the New Testament warns that existing generation about the severity of judgment that will be on their heads because their judgment will be far greater than those earlier generations in antiquity, such as were seen in the days of the Queen of Sheba and, and other periods, because the decisive crisis point has been reached with the coming of the Messiah. And he talks about the judgment that will come upon this generation. And the plain sense of those warnings refers to the judgment that will befall that last final generation of apostate Israel at that time. In fact, apart from the use of this word genea, or generation, that we find in the Olivet Discourse, there are 38 other references to this word in the New Testament, and every one of them refers to a contemporary group of people that were then alive. Now, it's possible linguistically that Ganea could mean sort or type, or as Ritterboss suggests, a mind frame rather than a time frame. But what I'm saying to you is that the exegetical and linguistic evidence against that is overwhelming. And one would have to have a compelling reason to interpret the phrase, this generation shall not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. To, would there have to be a compelling reason to interpret that other than the ordinary usage of the term. And the question is, do we have that compelling reason? Well, of course we have a compelling reason, according to uh, many evangelical people. And the compelling reason is, the end of the age hasn't happened, Jesus hasn't come. <laughs> so, obviously, if Jesus is telling the truth, then we have to interpret Ganea in a way other than the ordinary sense in which it is used in the New Testament. But, what if the end of the age has come? What if what Jesus is talking about here is not the end of history, but the end of the Jewish age? What if Jesus is talking about not his final consummate coming to fulfill all prophecy about the final uh, renovation of heaven and earth, but what he's talking about is his coming of judgment on Israel, which is manifested in the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem? What if that's the focal point of his warning on the Mount of Olives? I believe it is. I'm not positive, but I, am, I do believe that that's what he was talking about there. And in our next session...